So what if you have elevated eye pressures or glaucoma or you're being treated for elevated eye pressures and you have floaters? Can you treat people with elevated pressures with a laser? Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm James Johnson. I'm medical director of Vitreous Floater Solutions. I am the floater doctor. And all I do as an ophthalmologist in Southern California is treat eye floaters that are in the vitreous. But what if there's another condition that goes along with that, and that is of elevated eye pressure? So let's talk a little bit first about what glaucoma is. Um, if you have glaucoma, you probably already know this, but maybe your doctor has never actually sat down and explained it to you. We'll talk about that, we'll talk about the issue of floaters, and we'll talk about some of the types of floaters that might be an issue that might actually cause an elevated eye pressure after treatment. So first of all, there are two fluid chambers of the eye. <clears throat> the back chamber here is the vitreous, that's where the floaters reside. And then there's a separate uh, fluid chamber up front. There are some specialty cells up in the ciliary body here that secrete some clear fluid that kind of percolates into that front part of the eye. And then at what's called the angle where the cornea and the iris come together here and here, where at the, at the angle inside there, that's where the fluid normally drains. So it drains through there. So the pressure the eye pressure, which could, could conceivably be measured anywhere and everywhere throughout the eye, is actually regulated by this front part here, which is the fluid that is produced and the fluid that's drained, produced, drained, produced, drained, all day long, all night long, and it's the balance of those two that determines the eye pressure. Now, there is a range of pressures that the eye likes to work in. We generally measure them in millimeters of mercury, it's just a way of measuring pressure, and there is a range. Just like the tire in your car, uh, the, the manufacturer says it should be inflated to this range. Well, the eye needs to be inflated to a certain fluid range. And in numbers, that would be something like you know 12 to 21 or so. That's usually traditionally has been considered a normal range of pressure. Rarely does it go a whole lot lower. It can, and that's generally not a problem. Um, but it can go a lot higher. <clears throat> and so if there's a problem, and generally, you know, the drainage system, if that angle is narrower, the fluid isn't drained very well, it's getting gunked up or clogged up with stuff, uh, and you continue to make that fluid and it's not draining very well, you can have a subsequent elevation of pressure. It could be in the low 20s. Um, it's possible that pressures could go into the 30s, 40s, 50s, which is really kind of an urgent, emergent uh, condition if it goes that high. Um, now, interestingly enough, the eye will generally tolerate fairly high pressures or moderately elevated pressures pretty well with the exception of one area and that is where the optic nerve, this structure here, plugs into the back of the eye, the optic nerve head right there. And it is in, in many ways uh, described as a watershed area for blood flow. Um, so if, if the, the, the blood flow is pretty good to all the structures inside the eye, this is just an area that just doesn't have its own dedicated blood, blood supply here. Um, if there is an elevated eye pressure pushing back at the blood, trying to get to that area, uh, you might have a decreased blood flow to that optic nerve head. Decreased blood flow to nerve tissues can cause damage or loss of those, of those tissues. And so what we often see with glaucoma is actually looking into the eye, we can see a divoting and a, what we call cupping which is a measure, which is an indicator of loss of nerve tissue in that area. The way that that manifests for the patient, what the patient experiences, is generally loss of peripheral vision, not central vision, but peripheral vision. So they can have a, a very slow, gradual narrowing, narrowing of their uh, peripheral vision and can continue to have very, very good central vision all along until it's quite advanced. It is painless. Uh, it is slow and gradual, especially the, the far peripheral damage, and it may not even be noticed by the patient. And if they are starting to notice it, it's usually quite advanced, and it's not a good, good point to be noticing it. So <clears throat> the way that uh, glaucoma is treated is treated a couple of different ways, but generally, um, since we cannot change the blood flow to the optic nerve head there, all we can really do is try to adjust and change somehow the fluid dynamics to the front part of the eye. And, uh, you know, imagine if you had a sink with, uh, with a small drain at the bottom there and you turn on the faucet, you might get to a point where the amount 
flowing out through the drain is the same as that flowing in. But what if that drainage system gets a little gunked up and not flowing very well? You'll see the water level increase and maybe even overflow uh, through the basin. Well, there is no overflow in the eye, but you can't have an increase in pressure and, and, and maybe a, a new balance and new homeostasis with that. Uh, and if that elevated pressure is high enough and causes continued damage to the optic nerve, it's not a good situation. So, the problem with treating some floaters is, well, first of all, there's different types of floaters. There are some that are kind of hard and plasticky and dense and brittle. There are some kind of loose and diffuse cobwebs and types like that. These are generally not a problem when it comes to elevated eye pressure. The ones we're concerned about are these large, dense, hazy, cloudy floaters where it's just like all the proteins have aggregated and clumped up and glommed onto themselves. And you get these really large, very oppressive, uh, intermittently obstructive floaters. Now, back there, it's not, it's not a, th a threat or a problem to, the ele to an elevated eye pressure. But if a laser operator treats that very aggressively, you can get some initially some very good improvement in the, the, the decrease in the bothersomeness of those floaters. But because these cloudy floaters are not vaporized or destroyed as efficiently as the more denser and plasticky ones are, like the Weiss rings and cobwebs, um, the result of that treatment tends to kick out a lot of microscopic protein debris. Now, these are, I'm just stippling this here throughout that vitreous space there, uh, just sort of uh, symbolically saying, you know, there's proteins that have been kind of scattered throughout there. Now, these proteins that are scattered in that space are not visible, so the, the patient's uh, subjective symptoms of the floaters are, are vastly improved even after that first treatment. But there's two problems with this. One is, is has nothing to do with elevated eye pressure, but there, these, uh, these, this debris is sticky and those protein bits tend to sort of aggregate and reclump and reform. So even as soon as that first 24 hours, you might, the patient might even come back the next day with a sort of dense, uh, linear, fuzzy little strands, you know, represented something like that. Now, I will say that as far as mass and volume of the proteins, this is an improvement, but that can still be quite bothersome. So what does that require? That requires more treatment. And you try to destroy that, and you kick out some protein debris, and you might have some reformation. So treating these larger, cloudier floaters is like taking a journey, as we say, of you know, three or four steps forward and one or two steps back. Three or four steps forward and one or two steps back. There's improvement and backsliding. Improvement and backsliding. It's just the nature of the beast. I have not found a set of settings or a treatment style or technique that prevents or avoids that. So that's just an expectation, perhaps, of treating that type of floater. What we're more concerned about is these free little agents now have the opportunity of finding their way somehow into the front part of the eye. And if there's a lot of this and it's overwhelming, you can gunk up and clog up that drainage system so you're making that fluid, you're not draining it very well, and you can get an increase of pressure. Now, that is something I would like to try to avoid. Um, all I do is treat floaters in my practice. I get maybe a couple of patients, two, probably not three, but somewhere between two and three patients every year that will respond with an elevated eye pressure. Generally, if that happens, we don't do any more treatment, at least at that time. Uh, if it goes high enough, uh, and, and they're symptomatic and it goes high enough, they may need to put on some, some eye drops, just like we treat glaucoma patients, to lower the pressure, put the pressure into a safe range, then what typically happens with these patients is they might be on these drops for two months, three months or so. Maybe they're back home getting the pressures monitored once a month or every six weeks or something like that with their local doctor. And usually somewhere in the two or three month range, we can kind of wean them off or have them stop the eye drops, give it a few or several days for a washout period and have the pressures checked. Uh, if the pressures are back down to normal again, we're good. If they're still high, put them back on the drops for another month or so, and we kind of play that game until the pressures have, have gone back to the normal range. And fortunately, um, they do, and they have. So this has not turned into a permanent elevation of eye pressures, but it's something we want to try to avoid. And furthermore, uh, if the patient were to come back the next day with a bump in their eye pressure, and there really should be no change in pressure whatsoever with treatment, but if they come back with an, a bump in their eye pressure, um, it would be, I think, irresponsible to go in and do more treatment and, and possibly push that pressure even higher. 
So if, uh, if after a treatment, and if it's going to happen, it usually happens after the first treatment, uh, they come back the next day, we check the pressure, they're symptomatic or not, but the pressure's high, uh, we're kind of done. Now, it gets complicated, the decision making gets complicated because then, well, let's say they go back home, the pressures go back to normal, everything's back to normal, and they want to come back and do more treatment. You know, is that safe? Is that responsible to do so? I really struggle with that. Um, the, the safest thing to do is like, nope, we're done, no more treatment, we're done, we're done. But that leaves them with floaters still, and the only other treatment would be for them to then pursue a surgical procedure of the vitrectomy where they go in and remove all of the vitreous, which is a whole nother level of uh, aggressiveness and potential risk. So oftentimes these patients are motivated to come back with more treatment, even knowing that they may be at risk for more treatment, and it just has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. There are times where I'll just say, you know what, I really don't want to do any more. I, I just, that pressure was too high last time. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with that. And then there are times where maybe we can go in and do a little light treatment, maybe just go after that one thing there and not really treat much of anything else. I'm never really happy about that, but those have sometimes you know, worked out pretty well as, as well. But you know, it's all part of the patient being a participant in an educated, informed participant in this process and trying to uh, come to a, a, a treatment plan that mitigates the risk as much as possible. So, uh, yes, I can treat uh, all kinds of floaters, big ones, small ones, cloudy ones, dense ones, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the main risks that I list in my consent form are risk of injury to the retina. How do you avoid that? Just stay away from the retina. Risk of injury to the natural crystalline lens. How do you prevent that? You stay away from the lens. This one of the elevated eye pressure is a little bit more of a rogue risk in the sense that it's not simply a matter of just avoiding this or avoiding that. And you know, stay away from that anatomical structure. Stay away from that anatomical structure. It's about making some decision make, uh, decisions to help uh, reduce that risk and prevent that from happening. Since instituting some of these risk mitigation measures, um, um, I've seen the incidence of the elevated pressure uh, has become less and decreased. So that's that's good and that's favorable. Um, so that's the it. Uh, if somebody were to come to me and they are uh, on like two different medications. Uh, for lowering the pressure, boy, I'm going to be really reluctant. Unless they have a Weiss ring, unless they have one of these small, dense, sort of plasticky ones, or maybe just some cobwebs or something like that, if they have any of those denser, cloudier floaters, I'm going to be really reluctant to uh, recommend or suggest or to treat those patients. The nice thing about the Weiss rings is that they just don't cause elevated pressures. I mean, they just don't. And so uh, these can be treated uh, very comfortably without that risk of elevated pressure. These uh, types of floaters, they don't reform, they don't re-aggregate. I'm allowed my favorites, and the Weiss rings are my favorites. So uh, we just have to address this issue of the potential of elevated pressure on a case-by-case -case basis. It is a known risk um, compared to that of pressure and that of, of injuries to the lens. These are statistically approaching zero. Uh, the elevated eye pressure, again, two to three patients, maybe a year or so, uh, and, and on the decline. So uh, that gives us an overview of the problem of elevated pressure after treatment. It doesn't happen very often. It's mostly avoidable, uh, but it is a known risk. So uh, we have to be aware of that if we're considering treatment. All right. So again, I'm Dr. James Johnson. I'm the medical director of Vitreous Floater Solutions. I am the floater doctor. All I do is treat floaters. If you have questions regarding this topic or any other topic, first of all, check the website thefloaterdoctor.com. Uh, there is a ton of information there and really does address most of these very common and slightly obscure questions regarding floater treatment, uh, as well as you know costs, insurance issues, uh, logistics, do you need a driver, are there restrictions of activity, all that kind of stuff is answered in detail there. If you still have questions, on the front of the website, uh, the landing page of the website, homepage, uh, there is a contact form. You can fill that out with your details. Uh, ask a question, it comes directly to me. I answer those usually within 24 hours or so, usually. There's also an opportunity to schedule a phone consultation with me. I have a few, uh, a few spots, a, few, uh, a couple hours set aside during the week to take care of those. I'd be glad to talk to you about that as well. That's just a little more, more per personal approach to the same thing. All right, so thank you for your interest. Uh, contact me if you need to, and I look forward to seeing you here in Southern California to treat those floaters that are making you a little bit crazy. Okay, all right, have a good day.